Welcome to this Kluge Conversation. My name is Kevin Butterfield, the director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. We're joined today by Sophia Rosenfeld, Walter H. Annenberg Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania, and Kluge Chair in Countries and Cultures of the North. And we're going to explore the question, are conspiracy theories inevitable in a democratic society? Thanks for being here with me. Thanks for inviting me. I want to start with a, a, this, this big question by exploring something that you've written about in different ways in, in a couple of your works. Uh, this question of how we know what's true. And in a democratic society, I think if someone stops and thinks about it for a minute, there is a basic question of who gets to decide what's true. Can we start there, this question of sure. truth in a democracy? Sure. I mean, one of the really interesting things about democracy is that nobody really gets to say what's true. No one person, no one institution, no one method even, has been established as the arbiter for truth. So that makes getting to truth always a kind of a messy business. And it's a business that involves experts of different kinds, but also ordinary people. And ideally, they come to some kind of loose consensus, and we get kind of established truths. But it's sometimes pretty hard to get there in a democracy. But, uh, when we talk about monopolies on truth, what, what, what has served as monopolies on truth in the past? Well, in a society that has a single source of authority, say there's a king or a religious leader or somebody that gets to be the arbiter of what's true and what's correct, it's pretty clear where authority lies. But one of the principles of American and really other democratic cultures too, uh, life as established as far back as the 18th century, was that authority wouldn't be vested in any really single place. And that in fact, there'd be pretty wide leeway for people to disagree and simply have to agree on some very low level premises, not on sort of fundamental truths at all. And even those low level agreements are kind of hard to arrive at. When you talk about a source of truth or a source of authority in a democracy, I think the people, uh, and I think majority rule. Uh, when you t and you, you mentioned a, sort of a, a consensus, uh, a loose consensus, or an agreement that we can disagree a bit. Could you talk a little bit about where the majoritarian democracy fits into what you're describing? Yes, that's really an important question, because what we don't vote on is what's true. We vote for representatives who we hope will make good decisions on our behalf, but we don't ever kind of uh, set down and say, let's vote this up or down, you know. Um, cigarettes are bad for your health, g true right. or false. Right. We have a much looser way of getting there. Though it's not completely removed from the political process because of course it's upon various kinds of truths that good policy is made. So we disagree sometimes about what's true and sometimes we agree what's true but disagree about what to do about it. And those are kind of different steps in the process. And if we take us to the current moment, uh, what's a good example of something where we agree what's true but we disagree on how to resolve or how to deal with that issue? Yeah, so there, there, a basic idea might be something like this. The unemployment rate is announced at certain intervals. We don't think of that as partisan information. We think of that as expert arrived at information. Now we know that what we count as an unemployment rate is already um, could be subject to dispute. Mm -hmm. you know, do you only count people who are looking for work? Do you count all people who are unemployed, say? But if we agree on that sort of basic fact and we treat it as a fact, we would then go on to have, ideally, a kind of productive dis dispute, let's say, or even conversation about what's the best thing to do in the circumstances given this, given we want to increase employment, say. Yeah. But if we, if half the people in the room thought unemployment were up and half thought unemployment were down, it would be very hard to have a very good discussion about what to do because you haven't agreed on the sort of starting premises. Let's start, uh, let's dive into this question that it, it's all over your, your um, more recent book, Democracy and Truth, this question of expertise mm -hmm. and uh, understanding intellectual authority in some ways and, and where that fits into a democracy. And we haven't really talked about this specifically yet in this conversation, is um, experts, people that have studied a particular subject mm. and how much the people 
broadly or individually should defer to them. Uh, I think very uh, famously of Thomas Jefferson talking about a plowman and a professor and, and, yeah. and he would trust the judgment of the plowman, not the professor. Um, is, is this question of, of deference to intellectual authority uh, related to what we're describing? Absolutely it is because even in the 18th century, we'll go back to your Jefferson example, there's a strong sense that both expertise and what was even by Jefferson referred to as common sense need to sort of find a meeting ground. Hmm. So government was never, th it was never thought that it would be possible to run the country entirely without any kind of expertise. You needed doctors to solve medical problems, for instance. You needed map makers to figure out what the terrain looked like. There's a reason there's a Library of Congress. It is, in fact, to provide information to government initially. Yeah. So there's been a strong preference for information and expert information at that as a kind of driver of political life. But that said, there's also been a strong skepticism from the beginning of experts, sometimes because they're connected to government, sometimes just because they seem like highfalutin people with a lot of jargon that doesn't add up to a lot of common sense. Yeah. And um, those things are always in some kind of tension. In some moments, there may be more of a preference for expertise. If you took expertise to its extreme end, it would be something like a technocracy. And then there are moments when there's a kind of bias towards the plowman, the common sense of the farmer who goes out and knows what's going on better in a kind of experiential way than the expert sitting in a library. And uh, those might be moments where we start talking about something more like populism. And, and that's exactly where I was thinking we might go, because okay. this question of populism uh, is, it's certainly the case that when you make appeals to the common sense of the masses of the people, that you're assuming a couple of things. And one of them is defining who the people are, who's mm -hmm. included and who's not included. Uh, and another one is that this is going to, uh, that common sense, that wisdom of the people must prevail. There's this sort of authoritative mm -hmm. force because of what we already said about democracy, box populi, box day. And so with that, are, are when we, um, have this preference as uh, say in American culture or in other Western cultures for the common sense of the masses of the people does it necessarily turn into a populist argument uh, a populist position how has it uh, taken shape historically yeah. so it's and in, in some ways getting to even who the people are has gotten harder over time rather than easier in the 18th century it was pretty obvious who that was mm. and it excluded a tremendous number of people um, today we would like to think of the people in a much more expansive way, but that also means a greater diversity of points of view and lived experience. Yeah. So that getting to anything like a, a loose consensus, a common sense, is actually a harder thing and for some very good reasons. But the, the question of whether this has to be an exclusionary idea, common mm -hmm. sense, is a, and therefore lead to a kind of populism, is an important one because in an ideal expression, maybe we would be able to say the people's wisdom helps us sort of take experts down to size, gets us back to something like real experience. Yeah. But in practice, often it's been wielded to do something quite different, which is to say, we're the real people and those people aren't. And that exclusionary part about who counts as the people has often made appeals to common sense turn into a kind of populism. A populism that not only rejects experts, say, but might reject whole other segments of the population as not real, not the true people, not the people who really know what's going on. This question of, uh, that we're here to talk about today of conspiracy theories, I think we can bring in at this point, because uh, the origins of these uh, conspiracy theories, whether we're in the 18th century or the 21st, um, I, obviously they can come from all kinds of places, but I think people often think of them as coming from a kind of reactionary, uh, anxi anxious people mm -hmm. uh, who are trying to make sense of this complicated world around them, trying to make sense of, of uh, who's really pulling the levers of power. Uh, is, is that, the case, first of all, historically, are conspiracy theories, do they typically come from people outside of power trying to make sense of what's happening? And is it, is it necessarily, uh, or often, is it coming from ordinary people that we've been talking about? So conspiracy theories, I think, can come from anywhere. They can come from the highest reaches of 
power, and they can come from below. And they can also show up in all kinds of different kinds of societies and governments. They have two basic kinds of appeal. One is that you get something very complicated and hard to understand, and if you can find just the right culprit, you've sort of simplified the whole thing. So everything starts to make sense. And they also give you a little bit of a personal superiority, the mm -hmm. sense that everybody else has had the wool pulled over their eyes, but you know, and you're in touch with the other like-minded people who know something everybody else doesn't know. Yeah. So you can see why conspiracy theories are appealing, particularly in periods when it's hard to make sense of what's happening. Sometimes they thrive in what I would call information-poor environments. So say a dictatorship where it's hard to, or in going back, if we want to go back historically, societies in which there's not much, it's hard to get your hands on the news, everything's rumor, say. Yeah. So conspiracies are kind of a natural outgrowth. You know, I heard somebody told me, and they told this other person. But you think, why are conspiracy theories flourishing now? It's a harder question in a way, because we're in this sort of information-rich moment. Yep. I get out my phone, I can have access to every newspaper in the world and every news source. But on the other hand, it's harder and harder to know what to trust, mm -hmm. who's telling you something that counts as truth, and what. The, and the issues in many cases have gotten so complicated. Our world is so diverse and complex that the appeal of conspiracy theories has, in a sense, blossomed. Let's dive back into a period that, that I know well, which is the American Revolution, mm -hmm. or, or a period uh, like the French Revolution. Um, in the American Revolution, there are uh, conspiracy theories swirling on both sides of the Atlantic. Yes. The British uh, believe this about the Americans. The Americans believe that about the British. Uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, has a little bit of conspiracy theory mm -hmm. uh, mixed in with the opening paragraph. Um, the French Revolution, people making sense of this massive earth-shattering moment, uh, and I'm thinking of some of the subsequent explanations like the Illuminati uh, stories mm -hmm. that people were telling in the 1790s. Are these, um, of, are these the same thing, essentially, as what we see in the 21st century, or are they something different? So one reason I think conspiracy theories were so rich in the late 18th century, and absolutely on both sides of the Atlantic, um, has to do with the idea that monarchies traditionally prided themselves in a way on their secrecy. There was no tradition of sort of publicity that everything had to be made evident to everyone everywhere, transparency. So one way that people advocating for republics could make their case was to say, you don't know what's going on behind those closed doors and they're not about to tell us. Mm. And a sort of challenge to monarchical and aristocratic authority involved in a certain way a kind of conspiracy thinking that said yeah. something nefarious is going on, something bad, and when we get power, we're going to tear off the curtain and show you the you know what real, true Republican virtue looks like. It's what Republicans were saying to monarchists. It's what, exactly what Republicans were basically saying to monarchists. And they weren't entirely wrong because one of the principles of governing under monarchy was that monarchy shouldn't be entirely public. Dissimulation is a good tactic, for instance. Yeah. There's no reason for this kind of publicity. So there were good reasons for 18th century conspiracy theories. And in some ways, conspiracy theories have never gone away. They wane and wax, but they never really go away. At this moment, I think, they are back with something of a vengeance for a variety of reasons. Um, some of them, had, as I mentioned, having to do with the complexity of the issues of the moment. Some of them having to do with the ease with which they can circulate. The internet has been a great gift to information, good information, but also bad information. And that's also an element, if I can keep you in the 18th yeah. century for one more minute, that's also an element then as well, right? The, mm -hmm. the growing numbers of newspapers and right. uh, pamphlets and, and various media by which these are circulating, that's a historical phenomenon that wasn't as true in 1710 as it was in 1790. Absolutely. So what I refer to as a rumor, we often think of as something that's orally transmitted. And rumors can have a life of their own, but they travel pretty slowly because they have to go person to person to person. Yeah. With newspapers, and when they started circulating transatlantically, and sometimes then also north, northern southern hemisphere into Latin America and the age of revolutions in Latin America, 
there was much of the panic people feel now, which is you know, these all kinds of terrible things are going to circulate along with good things. And newspapers, as you know as well as I do, they, in the 18th century were highly polemical. They were not filled with truths. They were filled with scurrilous, horrible attacks on people. And, uh, any idea that everything was sort of nice and neat and polite until the 21st century is definitely wrong. I found this in your in your book, uh, George Washington in 1796, uh, describing newspapers. Uh, they've teamed with all the invective that disappointment, ignorance of facts, and malicious falsehoods can invent to misrepresent my politics and affections, to wound my reputation and feelings, yeah. and to weaken if not entirely destroy the confidence that you, the people, have been pleased to repose in me. That's exactly to your point. It, 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 it's, he sounds like he could be talking about the newspaper today. Any he? president of the Any Austin. president could say, I cannot yeah. believe they would write that about me. Yeah. Right. And I mean, in the Alien and Sedition Acts moment, um, there's a huge debate. Are newspapers really destroying democracy? Are we? We want dissent, but not this much dissent. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a, a very interesting question yeah. is, is sort of at what point are newspapers protectors of democratic life? And at what point are they kind of eating away at the fabric of the political culture? You've taken me into a, a second area I wanted to explore with you, the spread of information, the circulation of ideas, of, of, of false and true mm -hmm. things. Um, mm -hmm. Is actual information warfare, for lack of a better word, I'm thinking of cyber yeah. warfare as a term we might use today, is that a part of the history of conspiracy theories from the, the 18th century to today, uh, the deliberate sowing of false explanations for things in order to just wreak havoc? Uh, is that something that's always been here, or is it something new to our moment? So there's, there, it's interesting to, to, to think about that question of whether disinformation gets circulated more often to persuade somebody of something that isn't true, or just to wreak havoc, as mm -hmm. you're putting it, just to sort of undercut everything. And I think some of both have long been the case. Um, in our current media environment, one problem is misinformation, which is just bad information. A second problem is deliberate disinformation. And that's when somebody really knows they're spreading bad information and is doing it usually for some bad purpose, which is to say either to deceive people or to cause something to happen that um, otherwise wouldn't. And we can find a lot of both these days. One reason they seem to be prevalent, I think, is also because our new forms of communication don't involve a lot of vetting. And early newspapers, of course, didn't either. Mm -hmm. But something like the New York Times, the Washington Post, involves a level of fact-checking and uh, care about what ideas are disseminated that is not the norm for everything that one finds online. That's pretty obvious. Yeah. But the disappearance, in a way, of vetted information has been a real problem, I think, for um, our political culture. If you used to go somewhere like this, the Library of Congress, to look for good information, go to a reference librarian, that person's pulling from information that's been vetted at every stage, including by the person who's an authority on producing information that's usable. Yeah. I go online, I Google something, all this stuff comes up. I don't know what's a reputable source unless I recognize exactly where it's coming from. And I might be easily become a purveyor of misinformation myself without realizing that I'm disseminating either misinformation or disinformation. The, the swirl of, of highly and, and politically charged, highly inflammatory and politically charged um, news or opinion uh, seems to be part of the story too. George Washington's talk about it in 1796, mm -hmm. but um, I, I'm curious about your thoughts. Uh, some people that teach the, the rise of, of a political polarization, but also the rise of, of conspiracy thinking in, in, in our modern moment, point to the demise of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987 yeah. by the FCC, which sort of required news agencies to speak on both sides of an issue, uh, as opposed to um, what Rush Limbaugh, who went national the very next year, was able to do, which is to sit mm -hmm. and just hold court. Uh, is this related to the story? I you do think? think this is really important, because I don't think that technology by itself, going back to printing presses all the way to electronic communications, I don't think there's much of a political sort of bias um, 
towards any kind of government built into these okay. modes of communication. But around all of them, we erect kind of different kinds of use principles and huge legal structures. Yeah. And radio, for instance, which might have been the, the big mass media before the internet, television too, had a lot of rules around it that are not there today. Yeah. Rules about balance and fairness, rules about um, what kind of advertising could go, couldn't go. It, so we've watched the sort of deregulation of radio, and then the deregulation of television. Um, we didn't have news that was as specifically partisan till quite recently on television either. Mm -hmm. And then the internet basically doing a, it's the sort of the end of any kind of rules. Um, privately owned public sphere at this point with rules created basically in a corporate headquarters with very little oversight from the government and very few penalties for problems. And I think that has had a big role to play and it does pose some interesting questions for future, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but for future lawyers uh, <laughs> about uh, exactly what kind of regulation the world of electronic communications needs and what that should look like. The old rules of intellectual property, um, even the ways we've thought about the First Amendment may need to yeah. change. The, the first part of our conversation, we talked about the lack of a monopoly on truth, uh, the, 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 the democratic uh, formulation of what we can agree on as being true. In some ways, the internet would seem to fulfill that, right? This, this mass swirl of ideas. And there, there's one example that people, off, I, I think a very smart people have pointed to as, a, as an example of the success of the internet and reaching mm -hmm. that, and that's Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. This place where people are kind of sharing the creation of, 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 of knowledge and, and putting it into play. Somehow it works, I think. Uh, and to, to, a, to a surprising degree, it does. Yeah. Is, is that an exception that proves the rule, or what's going you on? No, I think both things are completely possible, and they're not really mutually exclusive. So if you look back at the 1990s now, which isn't that long ago, but the, the kind of techno utopianism of that moment was yeah. amazing. People thought, you know, there'll be no barriers to information, democracy is going to spring up all over the world because how are you going to keep people? Um, in places, even North Korea, say, would people would have access to information. The people would be able to sort of seize power in this way, organize, know what's happening elsewhere. And it now seems a little bit naive because we've also noticed that, say, dictators, authoritarians can also harness the power of the internet. Mm -hmm. All kinds of repressive forces can. Bad information can circulate as well as good. And it's interesting. I think that Wikipedia is a very interesting institution because somehow the kind of crowdsourcing model has there largely worked. Now, it's not perfect, but you know, we're not looking for perfection here. Yeah. But largely, it's been a success. And so have a large variety of other kinds of um, sites that spew bad information yeah. at us without much recourse. One of the, uh, the key points that I think we need to explore in thinking about the rise of conspiracy theories, whether it's in the 18th or the, the 21st century or in between, uh, is just a basic level of trust in mm -hmm. authority, trust in the government, uh, trust uh, that you, as an ordinary person, are being shown a reasonable approximation of what's true out there by the people that are sharing information, whether it's the news media or, or the, those uh, in, in, in government. Um, a recent Pew Research poll found that only two in ten Americans say they trust the government in Washington to do what is right just about always or most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, only two percent, by the way, said just about always, but 19 percent said most of the time. Uh -huh. uh, that, that level of trust, where just one in five um, has a basic trust in government, it, this, is, this feels um, measurably lower than it has been at different points in American history yes. and probably in other countries as well. Um, how do you connect this, this, demise, this decline in trust for governmental institutions in particular to the story we're trying to understand about conspiracy theories? Is as mm -hmm. conspiracy theories swirl, does trust in government decline because there are all these anxieties about uh, who's saying what and who to believe? Um, is, is one producing the other? 
It's a very good question. And I think there's a bit of a chicken and egg thing here about our hyper-partisanship at the moment yeah. and its relation to this question of trust. And you can imagine that sort of if you think that all information is partisan in a way and specific to a party or a person or a faction, then it's hard to trust the other side. Yeah. Well, but they, if even you if they're already, experts. Even, even if they're experts. experts. The interesting thing is when people answer, answer a survey like that, do they mean, do they trust elected officials or do they trust, or are they talking about trust in the whole government apparatus? Mm -hmm. And traditionally, we have tried to make some distinctions in that regard, that many parts of what we call the government here in Washington um, provide nonpartisan information that's useful for the doing of policy and civil servants are largely people who are not political, but are in the business of making yeah. the nation or the world run well. When people are asked about government, I think they're not necessarily making that distinction. And one problem seems to be the sense that everybody is up to something political all the time. Right. And therefore, even your doctor who gives you COVID information or the uh, environmental scientist who tells you about global warming or the... Um, analyst at the CIA who tells you about international politics, that these people can't be providing something like nonpartisan information. It has to be an element of spin. It's political. Yeah. And I'm only going to trust essentially my own team. Yeah. If you look at polls of, the, of American trust in government across um, decades, of course, Watergate is a key moment where yes. there's a, a, a massive decline. It, it, simultaneous with the Vietnam War and, and growing sense that uh, the, the, the United States government is not sharing complete information and that there actually are conspiracies happening. Mm -hmm. Watergate is a genuine conspiracy. The Vietnam War before that. Exactly right. Uh, that's, that decline, um, you, you, if I understand you right, you're saying that as people began to then see political spin and political and, par and partisan political thinking in every aspect of what government's happening, it's only going to continue to decline? It's a very hard, There's a hopelessness yeah. to what you're describing. No, I yeah. mean, I, I, I do think these things wax and wane. I don't okay. think there's a story in American or international life about a kind of democracy is always getting better and better or democracy is always on the way down. I mean, right. We've seen ups and downs. And of course, um, the, point, the moments you've pointed to, I said Vietnam, you said Watergate, Watergate. Um, are moments that felt like nadirs in their moment. And of course, there was a rebounding yeah. of democracy. So I think it's very important that we not sort of decide this is hopeless. And some of this is just part of the price we pay for living in a relatively free society is a very robust debate about what counts as truth all the time. That doesn't mean it's not better or worse or more worrisome than at some times than others. It also doesn't mean that democracy is permanent. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I think we're all become a little bit more aware than we had been, say, 10 years ago, that democracy can be precarious, that it's not a kind of, once you get there, this is it for the next few hundred years. Yeah. You know? uh, so I think we can both be hopeful, not give up the sense there's something can be done, and also clear-eyed enough to see the problems in our moment. Because it's only if you're clear-eyed enough and take this kind of historical perspective, I think, that you can start to think about remedies. You know, do, do the remedies lie in the world of law and regulation? Do they lie in the world of education? Do they lie in institutions? Is there something governments themselves can do to address these questions? Well, let's stay there then. What, what kind of uh, opportunities are there to improve uh, this hyper-partisan uh, politicalization yeah. uh, and, the, and the idea of really rebuilding trust? Um, are there, are, you, you mentioned lots of possible ways, but what's a way that makes sense to you yeah. to rebuild and trust? Trust, I think, is a key word here because we can't, this idea of, you know, I'll find out for myself or I'll do the research myself, it's not really possible. Our world is too complex. I can't tell you about the paths of diseases or about um, climate change or a variety of other things. I have to have some trust in expertise. Yeah. Um, None of us can find out everything for themselves. You're just, it just means you're trusting some other source rather than the source you started with. So the question, the big question is, how do we keep in some ways enough skepticism as Democrats, in the, in the broadest sense, people who believe in democracy, yeah. we are supposed to 
keep a little bit of skepticism all the time, which means, you know, always distrust authority a little bit and always ask, are those people being level with us? Mm -hmm. Not take things at face value. But too much skepticism, a sort of everybody's lying all the time, it's all propaganda, would get you t deep into conspiracy theory yeah. land. So where would, how do we get somewhere where there's enough trust that people can say, you know, I don't, I'm gonna have to go with the sort of basic scientific consensus on this because I don't have a way, and they might change their mind down the way, line too, but I don't really have a way to know better yeah. myself. And so I think this is very hard to get back now that we're sort of lost a lot of it. I don't think we can be ever imagine sort of entire success. As I said before, I think our world is too complicated with too many, the issues yeah. and the diversity of people and inequality of experience that we've had such different educations, different lived experiences, different levels of affluence that we don't seem to share enough to make it easy to get to any kind of consensus at the moment. Yeah. But if we have to think about kind of what can we do in this sort of middle level, I would point to, I guess, two places that I think might make a difference. One is education. I think we need new kinds of education that really address head on this question of how do we know things? And teaching students, whether they're in kindergarten or they're graduate students, um, something about both how to challenge ideas effectively, but also how sound information is created across different disciplines and in different ways, and teaching what good information looks like, how you verify it. I think we need this more than we've done in the past, um, precisely because we're not, say, all embedded in reference desks where we might have been once, where that was kind of done for us. Is this happening? Less than you'd think. I think that there's really, I mean, education is slow to turn as a whole, but it is a place that I would look, and I don't mean simply classrooms, I mean all kinds of institutions, museums, libraries, research centers, trying to rebuild a sense of what is fact, for yeah. instance. So that would be one place. And the second place that I would look is perhaps more complicated, but I do think that we'll have to, over time, um, think about the ways in which our legal structures and our economic models aren't really working in the internet age. That the public sphere, as it's become electronic, is not really the same as the street corner. The street corner is public space, and the um, you know Google isn't, right? Hmm. And Twitter isn't, and um, I, I don't have really good solutions here, but there's been some very interesting work lately about thinking, what if the internet became a public utility, for instance? What would right. that look like? What would a different version of our understanding of certain kinds of First Amendment jurisprudence look like, in which we thought um, we continued to protect dissent, but didn't have as robust protection for lies of different kinds? Could we rethink the penalties around lying or dissem dissem uh, disseminating disinformation. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. It's certainly true that the American model is exceptional. It is. Search. It is. And Europe, for instance, has done much more in this regard in terms of regulating the internet. And I think we'll have to look internationally. I'm not saying that we, there's a solution sitting there on the table, but it will be a problem for the next generation, those people who are being trained right now in this, in the world of um, American law will have to certainly tackle some of this in new ways. Uh, so I see these as kind of long-term challenges. These are not quick panaceas. I don't think, you know, fact-checking is great, but we're not going to all be convinced because the New York Times has a fact-checker working there yeah. or factcheck.org says something. So you've given us a bit of a path forward, uh, an opportunity to, to look at ways to rebuild trust, um, education, thinking about also um, we, that we should, as a people, think critically about how we exchange and, and share information and mm -hmm. maybe find ways to, uh, to help obviate some of the, the challenges that we face. Um, when you look at some of the 
prevalent conspiracy theories of our own moment, and I, I know the names of some of them, although mm -hmm. I don't even know the details. Um, uh, but something like QAnon or yeah. a similar thing, do these things have a, a lifespan? When you look at them as, as a historian, do you see the, do you see this as running a uh, probably running a certain course, or is it anybody's guess as to what happens to these kinds of uh, individual conspiracy theories? QAnon's very interesting because it picks up so many elements of traditional conspiracy theories and reworks them to fit this moment. But it's full of things from the child trafficking to the role of, uh, to forms of Jewish conspiracy theory and the, the focus on Soros, for instance, that you can see reappearing at intervals through the last, you know, I'm gonna say more than 300 years, I mean, before the age of democratic revolutions. Yeah. Um, so these are, many of the elements just keep coming back in new forms. In, in, invaders at the borders, that's one of the oldest tropes there is. So in some ways we're not going to get rid of them. But they thrive in moments of uncertainty and they thrive when people feel the ground beneath them shifting. So you mentioned earlier the American and French revolutions. Those were moments when people thought, what the heck is happening, yeah. right? I can't make sense of my daily life anymore. Conspiracy theories help with that. And uh, we've obviously reached a moment where people feel that way. Something's disappearing about the world that I know. The problems seem intractable. I don't know who to trust. I'm not sure government is the place I want to look for answers. All those things, when you put them together, make conspiracy theories not that surprising. And, and the internet gives them this incredible reach and speed but they're very, very traditional in form. Hmm. So one of the weirdest things about QAnon is actually just how old fashioned it looks. Wow. Well, thank you uh, for diving into this with me. Uh, I feel uh, more hopeful uh, and, and certainly better informed uh, about the, uh, the role of conspiracy theories in a democratic society. Um, any last thoughts when you, uh, if you are talking to students or uh, people at, uh, across the, the country as you talk about your work, uh, any last thoughts about where you see uh, ideas like the truth and uh, trust and in some ways, to going back to your first book, Common Sense, mm -hmm. uh, heading in the future, the 21st century? You know, I'm a historian, so I'm better talking about the past than what's going to come. Don't, I'm not a great pro pro sorry, prognosticator. <laughs> that said, I actually think thinking about the past helps you think about what's to come. It doesn't tell you what will happen, for sure, but it gives you tools for kind of analyzing where we are, what's new, what's not, looking for patterns. There aren't solutions in history, but they give you amazingly good tools for sort of, I think, perceiving the world that you're in and where it's going. So. The reason I've wanted to think about and write about concepts that you just mentioned, like truth, like democracy, like common sense in recent years, is that I think conceptualizing these in clearer terms, the kinds of things we don't really think about until they're in crisis. You know, truth, it's a good thing, but what is it? Helps you sort of see where, they're, where they've been, what they might look like, and where they might go. And I don't think truth is gonna disappear anytime soon. I'm not sure we're really post-truth as the expression goes, because that suggests there was sort of one thing here and now we've passed it. Yep. But I do think it helps us see that truth can be a lot of different things. There isn't one way of getting there. There isn't one set of ideas. And we are gonna have to put some actual work into restoring some kind of shared knowledge in the future. And it's, I think, one of the great challenges of the next epoch. Let me ask you one last question. Uh, you are, of course, our Kluge Chair in Countries and Cultures of the North here at the Library of Congress. Uh, has there been any, uh, anything that you've discovered at the Library of Congress that mm -hmm. has just uh, uh, been revelatory for you? A particular document or source or time that you spent here at the library that opened up a new way of thinking? Yes. Actually, I mean, it's marvelous to be here. It's absolutely marvelous. It's marvelous in two different axes. One is 
personally, the ability to find sources that I would never have found, including incredible visual material. Um, extraordinary. I was looking this week at a website that's actually about women getting the vote as expressed in sheet music. Hmm. You think, really? There were songs and you could buy a polka in 1852 about women's rights? Yes, you could. <laughs> and uh, the library has a wonderful collection of them. I don't think there's anywhere else you could find this. Okay. Um, so there are just incredible riches here. But the other thing that's for me been maybe just as important since I'm interested in these questions of truth, is knowing more about what the library does mm. and the ways in which the library serves both the general public and researchers or citizens like me, but also serves the rest of the US government. Uh, the discovery of you know, the size of the Congressional Research Service, for instance, and the range of things that they do, the way that knowledge production is part of when you people say, do you trust the government? Part of what the government is, is knowledge production. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it happens here, and I don't think I realized just how connected it was to the legislative process. I knew it was across the street from the Capitol, but exactly how intertwined those were was to me um, something of a discovery. And uh, in a strange way, that gives me incredible hope um, for the idea that politics and knowledge production are linked processes. They shouldn't pollute each other, but they both have an important role to play. And the Library of Congress is in some ways seems to me the kind of place where that happens. So I've found that to be as exciting as the documents. Well, thank you, Sophia Rosenfeld. This has been a fascinating conversation. And I'm so glad we had an opportunity to dive into your work during your time here at the Library of Congress. And thank you so much. It's been a wonderful pleasure to be here. Thank you.